Good morning to everybody. Glad you can join us here this morning. Let's do this. Would you stand with me? Turn to page 459. Page 459. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Page 459. As we sing it out this morning. What a fellowship. What a joy to What a peace is mine on the everlasting heart, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm, leaning, leaning, on the everlasting. On that second, oh how sweet to walk in the building way, on the everlasting. some people not here. There are uh, several families who are traveling to go visit their uh, family in other cities, and so keep them in your prayers. And uh, But I'm glad you're here. We're going to go ahead and open up in prayer. Clayton, would you please open, please, in prayer? Dear Lord Heaven, we thank you for allowing us to be here today in your house, God, and thank you for the safety of everybody making it here. I pray you just please be with those who weren't able to be here today, and just comfort them, and just take that care of them, dear Lord. And be with those who are traveling this weekend as well and going to see family and their mothers or anything like that. I just pray you can please put a hedge of protection over them, God. And just, we thank you so much for all the mothers here in, in our presence. And thank you so much for everything that they've done and all the strength that they have, God. And I pray you can please be with those that, that may be kind of having a little bit of a rough time today. Uh, and I just pray that you comfort them and give them peace and, and joy in their hearts, dear Lord. In Jesus' precious name, I pray to God. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and turn to page 277. What if it were today? Page 277. What if it were today? Oh, 
in in Christ as he returns and so what a what a great song to sing man that song just it's been a long time since we've sang that song it just kind of gets you going I enjoy that song maybe sing that one more often all right grab your bulletins if you would we have a couple things that we want to go over happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the room here uh, this morning and so thank you for joining us here but I did want to say happy Mother's Day we have some flowers to give away every mother uh, we as they exit today, we got a little flower. What kind of flower is it, Maria? Geranium. A little geranium for you to take home and plant. Uh, and so, uh, do you have a green thumb or not? I don't know. Uh, you'll find out. But anyways, those are those will be handed out on the way out the building today. But uh, happy Mother's Day. No service tonight. No PM service tonight. And so, uh, the last night of Awana is coming up this Wednesday. Show and tell. Uh, so if you have something, kids, you want to bring in, you got to show it. But hey, you have to tell about it. I'm not going to be the one telling. You've got to stand up and talk about it. So the last night of Awana is this week. Pray for the kids. I know some of them uh, are trying to complete their books. And in doing so, they have some uh, scripture to memorize and get completed. And I, we always want to encourage our, our young people to memorize scripture and Awana is doing just that. And so they have been working really hard. And so for that reason, we'll have an Awana uh, awards ceremony on the 21st, the 21st. Um, and so come on out and encourage our kids to uh, just, um, and just give them some encouragement for all the hard work they've done this year. And when I say hard work, hard work. They have memorized a lot of scripture over this past year. And the thing with Awana is they repeat it. Now, I remember, uh, you know, in Bible clubs, like you would remember it and then never and you get your little sticker and then you move on. Right. And there's no repeating it to keep that in memorization. But a lot of program, uh, you know, you, you memorize it as you go. If you're unfamiliar, you uh, you memorize it as you go. And then you have a review period. And in order to move on, am I right? Uh, for the Awana workers in here, Mrs. Everett and Stephanie and looking around Kayla, uh, you have to go back and recite all those verses again in one setting. And so uh, it, it is a very structured program when it comes to that and encouraging them to memorize scripture. And repetition 
is the soul of learning. So repeating that, that those Bible memorizations is good for them. All right, so that's next uh, Sunday, May 21st, Awana Award Ceremony. Does anybody know what Awana stands for? Ava, you want to want to say it nice and loud? Approved workmen are not ashamed. Very good job. Very good job. So that'll take place next week. Uh, next week in the e uh, the evening service after following uh, that service, we'll have a business meeting. And then don't forget at the end of this month, just a few weeks away, West Coast Baptist College, they're going to be coming in with their singing group, a trio. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that. That's May 28th. And as we push forward to June, as we push forward to June, we have game night on June 9th. Um, and then we have Vacation Bible School quickly approaching, okay? So with that on the back table today, on the back table, um, there is a craft, what are you calling it, Stephanie? Art take-home kit. Art take kit, okay? So what is an art take-home kit? You're going to get a backpack, and you're going to have some art supplies in it, some things to color, cut, do, uh, and so that will help, and you can do that on your own time. And so if you would like to receive one of those take-home kits to do some of that craft work at the house, uh, please sign up on the back table and then put your phone number so we can have that as well. All right, so if you, once again, if you want a, a take-home kit, so that way we're not all trying to do it at the same time in one place and rushing, we can do it in a, uh, in a timely manner. Sign up for that, take it home, and everything will be provided, right? So it's going to be all in the bag. It's a, it's a kit, right? It's a take-home kit. So, uh, so if you're interested in that, that's on the back table. And then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have on June 2nd and 3rd, June 2nd and 3rd, we're going to have a 24-hour prayer uh, here at the church for Vacation Bible School. You say, what is that? Well, this is the first time I'm doing it, so we're going to experience it together. So we're going to have a, a section of blocks um, time slots. And uh, if you sign up for that time slot, um, we're going to ask that you come here to the church and you're going to have a prayer list here at the church. Uh, and we will be praying here at the church in a 24 hour rotation, nonstop for 24. Well, you have to maybe wait for the one to come in and out. But uh, the idea is that we are going to, as a church corporately uh, and individually, at this moment, pray for 24 hours over Vacation Bible School. So there'll be some time slots uh, available. So if you have any questions, come see me. Uh, but there'll be somebody here rotating, uh, kind of just kind of being an overseer. But, um, but if you would like to sign up for one of those slots, we're going to have a sign-up sheet for that. So that's June 2nd and 3rd, a 24-hour prayer for Vacation Bible School and what we're praying for. You have a list of things that we're, we're specifically asking God uh, to do and help us with in, as, it, as it entails Vacation Bible School, okay? There'll be a craft night, uh, not craft night in the sense of let's uh, get together and build something uh, to take home. This is, this is more of a work night for the church. So May 16th at 6.30, if you want to avail yourself up here, there'll be stuff to do so we can uh, help spread out the workload amongst multiple hands rather than just a few. So a couple dates to remember, May 16th, 6.30 p.m., be here, uh, and then uh, be thinking about that June 2nd through the 3rd, 24-hour prayer here at the church, okay? Uh, and so with that being said, it is Mother's Day, and we have some flowers to give away. Uh, and all we're trying to do is just say, hey, the Bible talks uh, much about uh, women and much about mothers, and so uh, we are on, we're going to honor mothers here as well today. And so... With that being said, how are we going to do it? We've done the questions about who's driven the furthest, who's the newest mom. We've done those, the, we've done those before, and we're going to mix them in, but we're going to have some trivia as well, okay? Some trivia as well. So if you're a mom here, you get to participate. Uh, and so here we go. We will say this. We will say this. The newest mom, we've got a lot of new babies in the congregation, and uh, it's an amazing thing, and, and uh, I think we all, I, I want to give the newest mom, the newest mom. So the newest mom that I know of that's here is Megan Baker. Uh, and so Megan Baker, she's being a mom in the nursery. So Kyle, would you come up and, uh, and, and um, select one? You've got your choice up here. I don't know what they are, but they're different. 
Making What's that? For the women. It's petunias or impatience? What's the difference? <laughs> Ask Judy. Judy knows. <laughs> Which is easier to do? Impatience. Impatience are easier. What do they look like? All right, all right. There you go. All right. So, um, but man, we have, I, I tell you what, I'm so encouraged. And one of the things that we're working on is we are working on a toddler's room down in the basement. Judy always reminds me, that's what I prayed for, right? We, every time we have a, another baby, Judy goes, now preacher, you prayed for this. And I did, and we did as a church. And we, we acted upon faith, moving a nursery up here when we didn't have any babies at the time to even put into the nursery. And so... Um, uh, we prayed, and God uh, had answered some of that, those prayers. But we are in need now of a toddler room in the basement because with the amount of newborns, we can't be having blocks thrown across the room by some toddlers, okay? So we're going to separate out those. Uh, when you think about it, here's where, here's where the Lord's done. And, and praise the Lord for, for the young families in the church. And I think I was doing... We'll have four babies, newborns, within maybe five, within two months of each other. That's incredible. And so that's an awesome thing to have. Uh, but in doing so, we need to move out some of those older kids that came last year. And so the old nursery in the basement is going to be converted into a toddler's room because it has an adjoining restroom there. And so uh, pray with us about that. Now, in order to do that, this wasn't part of it. It's ad lib. So my wife gets worried in these moments. But... Um, <laughs> But we need workers, okay? We need workers. So if we're going to add another class, we need people to help with that. So I want you to pray about that and, uh, uh, and think about, could I fit? Now, it takes a special person to go take care of the toddlers because those are the ones that are walking. You know, newborns, you hold them. Everybody loves the newborns, right? Toddlers are the ones that are walking. Toddlers are the ones that are throwing the bricks across the room, okay? So it takes a special person. So if, you're praying, uh, if you would pray about that, we do need workers uh, to help with that class, okay? The next question here, okay? As we look in the scripture, right, uh, we, see, we see women throughout it, okay? Who, now moms, this is not a raise your hand, okay? Uh, this is just say the name, okay? Uh, who married a king that saved the children of Israel? Because for such a time as this was her famous statement. Moms, who is it? Oh, man, I have no idea who said that first. <laughs> who said that first? I don't know. Help me out. Charlotte, you said it. Come on up, Charlotte. Pick it out here. All right, here we go. Next question. What book of the Bible describes a mother more precious than rubies? God, Kyle answered. <laughs> he likes trivia. It's good. Uh, Nancy, come on up. Nancy got it right. Proverbs. All right. You got your pick here. What are these? Petunias? Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. I will say this. What? Uh, let's see. We did the youngest mother. All right. We'll say this. Well, I get in trouble with the oldest mother because they have to. No, I won't. Okay. The ladies are saying. We'll say the oldest mother in the congregation. The oldest mother in the congregation. We won't say ages. I'll just give a roundabout. Any mother here above the age of 80? Okay. All right. We've got several back in here. Any mothers here above the age of 85? Joyce, come on up here. All right. You can pick anyone you want. All right, we got two left here. All right. All right, all right. Let's see, we'll go an easy one here. 
who was the first mother of, that's recorded in scripture. Liz, good job. Liz, good job. The first Eve, Eve was the first mother recorded in scripture. What's that? Am I missing one? Okay. All right, the last one, the last one. This one's being covered up over here. We'll move it to this side. All right. Let's see here. One last question. All right. Who, what mother prayed so intensely that the priest looked on and said, man, there is something. I think she is just so worked up. She's probably drunk. Anybody remember what mother did I see? Did I hear? I heard Hannah. Hannah? All right, come on up. Hannah is correct. I was trying to do it differently this year. Maria was like, what should we do? Should we do who traveled the most? And, all? and we've done those before. And she goes, you should do some trivia. And so there's some good trivia. And there's a mother holding a grandchild. So <laughs> fitting. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you uh, to the moms that are in here that have lived a life that, that, that the scripture has called out for us to live. Uh, as fathers and mothers, we have roles and responsibilities within the home that God tells us that we should fill. And I believe what's happening in, in our world uh, and what's happening and when you see and you look out there, there are a couple reasons that you can attribute the things that are happening in our culture. But I think uh, one of those reasons, and we can get to the root cause ultimately, but is moms and dads aren't fulfilling the role that God has designed for them in the homes. And homes are struggling. And children are being raised without a, a mother to which God has given uh, clear instruction to or a father which God has given clear instruction to. And so we want to honor a godly mother today and, uh, and just praise the Lord for the godly mothers uh, that, that are present or that you've had. And I know today's not always a, a celebratory day for some. Some people did not have the mother that God had, uh, had, had uh, you know, described of what she should be, and so I understand that. And I know that there might be some that desire to be a mother, and God has not given them that child yet. And I know that there are some here that might be mourning the loss of a mother, that uh, maybe in their life they had a mom uh, that, that loved them and cared for them and filled that role, but maybe they're no longer here. And so I understand that. And so our prayers and thoughts uh, are with you as well. Uh, it, but we want to celebrate uh, our mothers here this morning. So let's go ahead and uh, I'd ask you to stand. We're going to pray that God uh, would just uh, protect our homes and our children and that we would, uh, I just ask a prayer for strength for our moms that are present. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for the assembly of, of uh, you know, just people that you've brought into this church. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you have done for us in this church and for the families that you've brought in and all these, these little kids running around, Lord, we're so grateful for that. Lord, I do pray for these mothers, uh, from the nursery uh, to mothers that are, that are now helping and in, uh, in, in loving on grandkids. Lord, we just pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you'd give them strength. We pray that you would just give them a, a hedge of protection as they endeavor to, to raise a child, help raise a child for the nurture and admonition of you. Lord, I, I pray that you would um, uh, just, uh, just be with our children that are here as that they, are, they are growing in a very changing world. Uh, Lord, a world that is, that is becoming more and more intolerant of your ways. Lord, your truth. And so I pray for our children. I pray that uh, they, would, they would fulfill their role in the home of honoring their mother and father. Lord, we love you and we praise you and uh, we thank you for your word to which we have that we can learn from and glean from and understand uh, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be, well, let's go ahead and stay. No. Are we ushers? Do we have our ushers in place? Our ushers in place. You may be seated. All right. We'll have our ushers come forward at this time. Amen. 
Good. Thank you, gentlemen. Mike Webb's out of town, and uh, he's usually the one that heads that up, so I appreciate you guys all running back there and stepping up to that. Kyle, would you please pray for us this morning? Lord, we're thankful and grateful for you, Lord, that you've given us life, Lord, and that we can celebrate Mother's Day today, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you've given to us, Lord. And we ask that this offering, Lord, you take and use this offering for you, Lord. Lord, we know that everything that we give to you, that you will bless us back to us, Lord. That's not why we give, Lord, but we understand we'll do that, Lord. We just ask that our hearts are prepared for this offering. Lord, that we give for the right people. I just pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, we got two specials this morning, and uh, we're going to bring our kids up a couple times, but we're going to have the Junior Church. The Junior Church, if you would come up, and we're going to sing your song at this time, the Junior Church kids. Come on up. We're going to have you guys stand right here. Come on up and put your arms here. Kids, you never know what you get when you get them on, uh, on a platform, and um, they did a good job. They did a good job. Would you stand with me in, in Christ alone as we sing it out here in Christ alone? 
Great job, kids.
Amen. Thank you. You kids can be dismissed. I thank the Lord for the, the parents that he, the mother that he gave me, the wife that he gave me, that, that, uh, they're all leaving, that, uh, that just uh, does try to teach our, our children God's truths and God's word. And so uh, if you have your Bibles here, Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15 is where we'll find ourselves today. We're looking at a mother here. We're going to take a, a short break from uh, Hebrews. We'll be back in Hebrews next week. But I wanted to challenge for our homes. Our homes do need uh, to, to recognize the responsibility, but not just recognize the responsibility, but to re recognize the, uh, the dangers that are lurking, um, uh, that are looking to attack our home, to attack our children. And so uh, we're going to take just a break from Hebrews to spend some time challenging us uh, both moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, anybody in this room, that, uh, that there uh, is a danger that is endeavoring to, uh, to take and draw uh, your home away from the Lord. And so we're going to look at that. But anyways, he, uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 28 is where we'll find ourselves. But it's interesting, when it comes to Mother's Day, uh, you know, you go to the, to the store and you might look for a card. Our kids, they make cards. And they get pretty creative, and they spend a lot of time just trying to, to do things for mom. And, and uh, they make cards all the time. They make cards uh, all year round, but uh, they, they, they get pretty creative. And it's interesting, when they make those cards, how much time they spend. And, uh, you know, um, many times in those cards, they'll try to convey how, how deeply they love their mother or how deeply they care about mom and what she does for us and them and... Um, it's interesting when it, the strain that it puts on you to find that perfect card or write that, that perfect letter or note. and uh, it, There's a lot of pressure uh, sometimes to, to, to give that same pressure that's on those cards, uh, the pressure uh, in, a, in a message, you know, to write. You think uh, uh, Mother's Day, you want to bring something home uh, to challenge uh, the people uh, about the home, and so it's interesting the amount of uh, thought and you know where am I going to go this time? Okay, I preached on Elizabeth last year. I preached on uh, on some other you know moms in the Bible, Hannah obviously, uh, but this year we're going to take a little bit of a different approach uh, and look at Matthew chapter 15. But it's interesting the founder of Mother's Day was Ann, uh, her name was Anna Jarvis, Anna Jarvis, and she spent 40 years developing this concept. Her drive was to create a holiday uh, that, that honored moms for what they do, uh, and it reached its fulfillment in 1914. So she worked 40 years to bring about this, this, this holiday, and she reached that, that desire, maybe that dream in 1914 uh, with a, president, a presidential proclamation by the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Anna... Had a few fears, though, and as a matter of fact, uh, later on in life, she, she wished that uh, the holiday would have taken off the calendar. Did you know that? Because uh, her fear had come true that, that uh, what she endeavored to do by way of just honoring moms and bringing recognition to moms, that it would be exploited by the florist industry, and it was, <laughs> and being exploited by the card industry, and it was, and 
the restaurant industry and the, another industry that we don't think of that, that, uh, that she was uh, fearful of was the telephone industry. And so it's interesting that at the end of her life she said, I just want to get back to what I desire to do in the first place, and that's just simply honoring mom. But nonetheless, uh, we'll do those things to honor mom. We'll send her a card and we'll buy her flowers. But I'm going to challenge you, don't wait for just this day to do that. That should be a daily part of your life. Why? Because the Bible teaches us to do these things. The Bible teaches us that, the, that our mothers are of great importance in the home. Our mothers are more precious, okay? So don't just wait to this day. As a matter of fact, if you're waiting to this day to do this, uh, to, to honor your mom, can I tell you, uh, you're not living according to the scripture, okay? Uh, and so let this day just be a day that you just, uh, you go on top of, okay? And so I want to preach about a great mother in scripture, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Let's go ahead and read it. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, the woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Isn't it interesting? Was she crying after the disciples or was she crying unto Christ? There's a big difference there. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she saith, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which shall fall, or which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. From that very hour. Notice in this passage how this mother had a problem. Now that doesn't ever happen in a mother's life. Doesn't moms have problems? Never. I know this passage is very relatable to every person in this room, mother or father. To every person in this room, this passage is relatable. So we're going to look at uh, this this morning and just take a few short moments to, to consider this Canaanite mother. Number one, she had a problem. Look with me again in verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Do you know what the Lord found in Tyre and Sidon? You know what he found while he went there? He found the same thing that he, that he found everywhere he went. He found someone that was in need. He found someone that had a problem. And so as he makes his way here into the coast, this mother has a problem. I, I, I guarantee you can, you can open a phone book, call any mother at random, and you'll ask her, and she'll probably tell you, that, yeah, there's issues. There's problems. Mothers are very special people in our lives. They are. They are very special people in our lives. They're, they're, there's a junior high science teacher and he lectured on the priorities of magnets, magnets for the, uh, the, the, the properties of magnets for the entire, entire class. So he's sitting there in the science class and he's discussing these magnets and, uh, and told them that there'd be a quiz tomorrow. The next day he gave the students a quiz. And the first question read like this, my name begins with M, has six letters, and I pick up things. What am I? Half the kids in the room didn't write magnet. They wrote mothers or mother. As Jesus went into the coast, there was a mom that had a problem. In any city, at any house, there could be a troubled mother. And the lady in our text was no exception. Let's look in verse 22. What was her problem? What was her problem? Verse 22, it says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. 
Notice this mother knew exactly what was wrong with her child. She knew exactly what was wrong with her child, and she said this, My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. I'm going to tell you, uh, this mother was very, very smart. I'm going to, I'm going to give you this this morning. Uh, the smartest mothers on earth recognize two things, that there is a devil. There is a devil. He's real, and he's trying to attack the home. I say he's uh, the home. There's no news to you today that the home is under attack. The devil is out to destroy your children. He is. Now, let me ask you this. There's not a mother in here. If she knew that someone was out to destroy her children, there's not a mother in here that wouldn't do everything she can to keep that from happening. Is that a truth here this morning? Look, I've seen Mama Bear in action. I've seen it. And my wife, I've seen it in my own mother. You mess with her kids. There is a truth to that. And I'm going to tell you, there is a real devil, and he is trying to destroy your children. And this mother knew it. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know he's seeking to devour? He's seeking to devour your children. He is. This mother knew it. She was vexed with the devil. You see, that stuff doesn't happen. It does. She recognized it. Look, the devil is attacking our children. The devil is attacking our homes. It's a vicious lion. Lions aren't, aren't, aren't you know, uh, they're not very gentle when they attack, are they? No, their one, their one desire is to kill and to eat. And can I tell you, the, Satan is, is destroying our children through avenues of social media. Now you say, preacher, you're going to get on your hobby horse. I'm not. I'm teaching you the truth. It, it, he, he, social media, I'm going to challenge you as a parent. I, 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 it is a dangerous thing for children to have social media. Okay? And if you want to talk to me outside of, a, outside of the message and want to have a conversation around it, we can. But I'm telling you, it is, it, Satan is using social media to destroy children. There's no question about it. Can I tell you, Satan's using social media to destroy homes, period. Be very careful with this. You know, a, a smart mother recognizes that Satan is real and he is set to destroy your home, your children. One of the avenues that he's set to do it is through, 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 through social media, through, uh, can I tell you, be careful of even education. You say, well, sending my kid to school, that's an innocent thing. Yeah, but it's it, what's being taught in schools. He's set to do it through entertainment. A smart mother recognizes that Satan is out there to destroy her children. Now there's people out there running around, I don't believe there's a devil. Can I tell you, that's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. That's exactly what Satan wants you to believe. Satan doesn't want anyone to realize that he's the one responsible for all the evil in the world. You see, the mother of our text had a problem. Her daughter, she, she knew, and she knew what the problem was. The devil was out to destroy her daughter. So what did she do? She sought the only one that could fix it. Here's what she said. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now, whether that be under attack, whether that be possession, we don't know. But she's grievously vexed with the devil. She had a problem. But she had a plan. She had a plan. Now, we do have many, many, many parents in this world that don't know what to do with their problems. Moms, dads, they don't know what to do with their problems. Many times, parents, when they endure a problem, they head to the, to, to the medicine cabinet. 
Maybe they head to their best friend to get some advice. Well, that best friend has the same problems. How much advice are they going to give? Maybe they head to whatever vice that dulls their senses. This mother knew her daughter was under attack. Satan was real, and she knew it, and she recognized that, that Satan was vexing her daughter, and she had a plan. She had a problem, and she knew where to turn. We're hearing more and more of major health problems with, in particular, moms, you can look at studies, are having more heart attacks than in previous years. Could it be that they don't know where to turn for the problems that they face? Once again, the mother of the text had a serious problem. Daughter was grievously vexed. Instead of worrying, now she no doubt worried, but that's not the end of her plan. She sought out the only one who could change it. You've heard the illustration about a mom and her worries. A, a, mo a mother told her son one day, you're about to worry me to death. Look at all the gray hair I am getting. Look at all these gray hairs I'm getting. Every one of them is because of you. The little boy turned to his mother and said, Mom, I, I know I have worried you, but, you have, uh, but I've not worried you as much as you've worried your mother. And the mom said, what do you mean? He said, well, Mom, Grandma is completely gray. You, you must have been a holy terror when you were a kid. Seriously, we're praying. Look, homes are paying a price Today, because we have mothers who have problems, we have dads who have problems, and they have no plan to solve their problem. All they do is go seek what the world says for a remedy, and guess what? It doesn't work. They live with their problems, and they die with them. And I, I say it again, the mom of our text knew exactly what to do. And she did the exact thing that every mom in this room should do. Look to verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts. And what did she do? And cried unto him. And cried unto him. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. This mother knew how to come to the Lord. She came with tears. I'm going to tell you, this child was blessed with a mother that loved her enough to shed some tears to the Savior. The Bible said she cried unto him. These weren't fake tears. They were real. This mother in our text was a loving mother who came to Christ with tears and cried unto him. But she came in humility. Humility. Look how she didn't come and say, God, you owe me. Christ, you owe me. You owe me this thing. Look, I've been in church every Sunday. You owe me this. That's not how she cried unto Christ, was it? Look at me in verse 22. What was her cry? Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. She knew that everything we get from the Lord is because of what? His mercy. Everything we get from the Lord is because of His mercy, not because we deserve anything. Look, here, here's what, and I'll say it again. She didn't say this. Lord, I deserve your assistance. This is the least you can do for me. I, I've, been, I've been faithful. You owe me. I tithe week after week. You owe me this. That wasn't her cry. I read my Bible, I read my Bible, and I pray, I pray, you owe me this one. She cried unto the Lord. Here's what she said. Have mercy on me. I'm not deserving. I'm not deserving. God doesn't owe you anything. Not anything. 
but praise God for his mercy. She didn't come saying, Lord, I deserve your help. Why? Because she didn't deserve it. Now, there, 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 there'll, be, there'll be times when, when people will stop sinning. And because they stopped sinning a certain thing that they had been involved with, they think now that God owes them or something. What we fail to realize is that we sin to God thousands and thousands of times. She knew she didn't deserve his blessing, so what did she ask for? Mercy. Everything we get from God is because of his mercy. It's not because we deserve it. Many people, here's how many times people approach God with their problems. Let's make a deal. Remember that that game show, Let's Make a Deal, right? And you you, you gambled and you said, uh, you know, I'll I'll take this for that or I'll take that by whatever. Let's make a deal. Do you have this on you? I'll give you this if you give me that. I tell you, that's not how we approach God. And this lady knew it. She had a problem. She had a plan. That plan was Christ and she cried out unto him with humility. Have mercy on me. This mother knew the best way to approach the Lord was through tears and humility. We uh, We need as parents to get desperate enough to shed tears for our children, to humble ourselves before our almighty God and seek His mercy. This mother prayed Here's what she prayed. Have mercy on me, O Lord. She had a problem. She had a plan. I want you to notice this. Well, let's get to it. She had a provider. She had a provider. Notice here, she came to the Lord for his help. And she had to overcome a few things. She had to overcome his silence. She cried unto the Lord in humility. And what was Christ's response? What was his response? Silence. And he answered her not a word. We all know that there are times when it seems God has become silent. And in those moments we're tempted to say, God, where are you at? He didn't say a word to this mother. She might have even been thinking, man, he can at least say something. I want to give you a few things when you think God is silent in your life. You say, man, I'm praying, I'm, I'm shedding tears, preacher, over what's going on. I'm, I'm going before him, uh, seeking his mercy, and it just seems as if he has not answered a word. What do I do? I'm going to give you a few things here. I want, to remember, I want you to remember Job. Remember Job? And when you think you're going through something hard, man, I'm telling you, his li- go to Job. I'm not saying that what he went through is, is much greater than yours. I mean, he went through some tragedy and some amazing things. But go beyond that. Go to the, go to the example that you have found in his life. Job was well acquainted with God's silence. If you read the book of Job, Job cries out in pain and suffering. He asks, Job even asks for answers. Why is this happening? He kept asking. But I want you to realize for 37 chapters, no response. No response. You know what Job went through. I don't have to re-preach that message. Losing family, losing livelihood, losing property, losing his friends. And he asks God and he pleads God for answers and God is silent for 37 chapters. His cries to God was only met with silence. And as Christians, we're not always going to hear God's voice. But I want you to look from Job, we can learn some practical things. I want you to, number one, start by examining your life. If you say, man, God's just silent in my life. I have not heard from him. I I just feel like he's been silent. I want to encourage you to examine your life. Begin by asking yourself, is there any unconfessed sin in my life? Is there any unconfessed sin in my life? You you say, why, preacher, should I ask God that? 
Because in Psalm 66, verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Make sure nothing is blocking you from being able to hear God's voice. And if God bring, if the Holy Spirit you examine, and you say, Lord, reveal to me any sin, that unconfessed sin in my life, and if He reveals it to you, I want to challenge you to seek forgiveness. Seek His forgiveness. So examine your life, number one. Number two, and the second thing I want you to do, accept God's authority. Recognize this, and here's, God can be silent. Accept His authority. God can be silent. There is no obligation to, for God to answer you. There's no obligation for God to fill you in on the details. He's able to do as He pleases always, everywhere, and forever. Like us, Job faced the choice of acknowledging God's authority. He was faced that choice of acknowledging or rejecting the authority of God in his life. In response to his suffering and loss, Job's wife encouraged him to do what? Curse God and die. What an outlook from your wife. But here's what Job's response. Here's what God's still silent. And here's what I say, Job had a decision to make. Am I going to accept the authority of God in my life, even in his silence? Now, I'm going to tell you that this verse brings, I mean, there's immense power in this verse. Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. You know what he's saying? I accept his authority. Whatever, whatever happens to me in my life, I accept his authority. Look, this mother had to overcome his silence. When God is silent in your life, I encourage you to examine your life, accept God's authority. Listen to what God is saying. You say, he's silent, how can I listen? Although God may be silent regarding a specific request or maybe a specific petition, Remember that he's in a constant state of communication with you. In fact, it is possible that you already have an answer from God. The Bible's full of specific answers about what is right and what is wrong. And it's found right here in his word. You say, I want, I want you to honestly, can God truly be silent to you if you have his word? Do you see what I'm saying? So if you, if, you, if you feel he's silent, listen to what he's saying. It's all recorded right here for you. He's recorded what you should do, what you shouldn't do, where you should go, what you should be a part of. The Bible is full of specific answers about what is right, what is wrong, as well as information about God's character and his intention for us as his children and his followers. So when he's silent, don't forget to dig into his word. He's written this book for you and I to communicate. He's written a communication to us to find out what he has to say about your problems. The problems you're facing, the problems you're going through. Can I tell you, the answers are available. So examine your life for unconfessed sin, accept God's authority, listen to what God is saying. Look, recognize this, that silence can be intimate. Silence can also bring a sign of God's trust in you. I want you to, I want you to recall in the Gospel of John, a story about Christ and his friend Lazarus. Mary and Martha are in it. When Jesus found out that Lazarus was, was ill, 
Rather than rushing to Lazarus' house to heal him, he stayed where he was at for how many days? John 11.6 says two more days. And before Jesus arrived in Bethany, Lazarus died. To Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, Jesus' silence could have been interrupted, uh, interpreted as neglect. That Jesus didn't care about or want to help them. That's how they could have interpreted his silence. Look, they sent for him and he didn't come. They could have interpreted that silence that he didn't care. This, can I... I'll pause here. This, this mirrors many of the emotions that we often feel when God doesn't immediately answer our cries for help. But in Jesus' silence, Mary and Martha are drawn into a new closeness and understanding of his power. Think about this. Had, had he rushed to his aid and healed them, would they have ever witnessed the miracle of their brother raising from the dead? Would they have witnessed the extreme power of Christ? Four days after he had died, he waited two days. Four days after he had died, Lazarus was raised from the dead by showing his power. Oswald Chambers said this, when, when you cannot hear God, you'll find that he has trusted you in the most intimate way possible, with absolute silence. Not a silence of despair, but one of pleasure because he saw that you could withstand the even bigger revelation. When you are completely comfortable with a person, it is possible, when you're comfortable, it is possible to sit in a room together and not utter a word. It's possible when you're completely comfortable. It is. You've been there. You've been in that, that, that doctor's office where you don't know that person across the way and you sense that just that uncomfortableness and you try to avoid contact. You're like, I'm not looking over there. It's like awkward, right? You sense that. But when you're, when you're comfortable with somebody and you sit in that room, look, a word doesn't even have to be muttered. And I will say, in Job's case, silence was also a result of that, that deep relationship. You say, when, when Satan approached God, in Job chapter 1, verse 8, God said this, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. God trusted him. The fifth thing I want you to do when, in those moments that you feel as if God's being silent, keep talking. Keep talking. Just because God seems silent doesn't mean you should doubt Him or stop praying. God's silence isn't a license for you to turn your back on Him. And it, it, here's what it really is. It's an invitation to press forward. Seek Him more diligently. The psalmist David wrote these words in Psalm 22, 2. It says, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. So he doesn't give up here, does he? Does the psalmist give up here? He says, I cried in the daytime, you, you didn't say anything, so I'm just done. That's not what the psalmist records here. He says, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. He says, I'm going to keep going. Job, all, all through those 36 chapters, he's continuing to cry, asking God to answer. And guess what? God answers his prayer. This Canaanite woman had to overcome the silence of the Lord. She had to co overcome what we could even recognize as maybe the rudeness of his disciples. Think about this. Verse 23, and his disciples came. And besought him, saying, send her away. Think about this. This is the disciples. Lord, get rid of her. She's, she's bothering us. She's, she's, crying. she's crying after us. She's just an annoyance. That's a, essentially what they're saying there. She's crying after us. She, they missed the point. She's crying unto Jesus. But their thing is she's just an annoyance. She's crying after us. She's just a bother. Send her away. She had overcome the, 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 the rudeness here of his disciples. 
They were egotistical. Not, not one of the disciples was named Lord, were, were they? She was crying unto the Lord, and they were saying, she crieth after us. No, she's not crying to you, buddy. She's crying to the Lord. Why you, stop bothering us. It's annoying. Why are you doing that? The world looks at you and says, why, why are you doing that? Why are you going down the church? Why are you, why are you continue to pray? Don't you know that problem that in your life? It's not going to get solved by just praying to God. Isn't that how often the world looks at us? She had overcome her rudeness. It's interesting here. Look at verse 22, how she addresses the Lord. O Lord, thou son of David. She had no claim on the Lord as a son of David, but yet she addressed him that anyway. She was a Syrophoenician woman. That's what she was. She was a Syrophoenician woman. That's a mixture of several races. She was not a Jew. It's a mixture of several races. She was what we would say a true Gentile. And at first he didn't answer. But look when he answered her, look what she said in verse 24, or what he said in verse 20. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That is, he's what he was saying. Jesus came fulfilling the prophecy as king of the Jews. When he died, that was the, 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 the superscription above, the, uh, above him there on the cross. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews in Matthew 27, verse 37. It's recorded for us. Jesus wanted to drive that stake in the ground that she might know that he was the pr promised Messiah. Look, I'm the promised Messiah. One day, that one day would sit on the throne of David. Look what he said next. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him. Think about that. He's really, in a sense, he's not rejecting her. He's, he's stating, look, uh, I'm, I'm here to fulfill uh, my role as king of the Jews. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it, it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Look, the Jews considered the Gentiles. History lesson, which you probably already know, the Jews considered the Gentiles dogs. This was a Gentile woman, which was probably why the disciples were so rude to her, because they considered her a dog. She got the message here. She understood what the Christ was saying. Look at verse 27. Here's what she says. And she said, truth. You're right. You're right. That's what I am. Yet the dogs eat from the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Here's, here, look at the humility of this mother. Look at what this mom did. It's as if she thought more or less of this, this way. If you, if you want me to be a dog, I'll be a dog if it takes healing my daughter. How humbling. How humbling. And Jesus saw the love and the faith of this mother. The love that this mother had for her, his, her daughter and for him. In verse 28, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, what did he say? Great is thy faith. Why? Because she knew Satan was real. She had a problem. She knew the only person that could fix it was Christ. And she wasn't leaving. She was persistent. She overcame his silence. She overcame the rudeness of his disciples. Many of us in those moments probably would have turned away. But she kept going further. What humility she showed. This mother received an answer from the Lord. The Bible tells us that her daughter was made whole that very hour. 
And God placed, I want you to understand, nothing, nothing is in your Bible to fill pages, okay? I want to reiterate that again. Every verse in the Word of God is there for a reason. This story, this, uh, this, this event recorded in God's Word is there for a reason. God placed this great mother in Scripture so that we can learn from her. She had a problem. She had a plan. And she had a provider. Christ. Would you stand with me? You're here this morning. Maybe you're going through a problem, but you've been going about seeking a fix to that problem in the wrong manner. Maybe you've been endeavoring to fix that problem the way the world does. But I pray that you would respond like this mother. Cry unto the Lord. Not because He owes you. Knowing that you're not deserving, Lord, have mercy on me. What did, what did Christ say of this woman's faith, this mother's faith, that it was great faith? She trusted that Jesus had the ability to heal her daughter. Do you have that faith this morning that God, that God is the way, God is the answer? you here this morning, I would encourage you to pray a hedge about your home, knowing that Satan is real. Be diligent as a parent, as a grandparent, understanding that Satan is seeking to desire, or seeking to devour your children. Now, in warding off ways to defend that that attack may not be popular. It may not be, uh, it may not be, uh, it may be looked upon as the world as strange, weird, wrong. But I pray that you would have the courage to stand up and do what's right in your home scripturally in defending your children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this morning. I thank you for allowing us to meet. I thank you for this example uh, of this mother who loved her child and understood that she had a problem, that problem wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, uh, contrived, but that, it was, uh, uh, that, that Satan had, had uh, just um, brought this issue upon her child and she sought out you uh, to fix it. Lord, may we mirror that when we experience these problems in our lives, that we would go to you and have faith. Even though in those moments of silence, when we desire to have our, an, our, our questions answered quickly, and you don't reply, Lord, I pray that we would seek to uh, stay faithful, stay asking. Lord, help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As the pianist plays, I want to encourage you that if you're experiencing problems today, maybe you've got some problems going on in your home, maybe problems with your children, Maybe problems with your grandchildren. Cry unto the Lord, have mercy upon me. Seek the Lord. You say, maybe, I'm, maybe, I, maybe you're experiencing that season of what seems to be silent. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you in these moments of silence to examine is there any unconfessed sin in my life that I need to, 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 to put out there and, con, and, and confess before the Lord trust in who God is Job said, though he slay me, though he slay me, whatever comes in my life, I'm still going forward. 
I will not reject him. Maybe the world tells you you can't do it that way. But God's word says you should. Commit to obey God's word. Right now, every person in this room should be praying the Lord to protect your home, protect your children, protect your grandchildren. I'm telling you, I believe the Christian home is under attack like no other. I mean, there's so many things out there trying to draw your children, your grandchildren away. Take this opportunity today. Many of you, many, many, many young families in here have young babies, young kids, young children. And commit now that you're going to raise that child for Christ no matter what the world tries to tell you, that you're going to stay sober and vigilant to ward off the attacks that, that are going to come your way and pray for your home. Grandparents, your children may not be in your home and your grandchildren may not be in your home, but your prayers are, are, are not ineffective. Pray for those grandchildren.
no greater joy than to know what? Let me know the rest of that verse. That my children walk in truth. Now, if you're here today and you've got a child that maybe is not living for the Lord, maybe they're what, what some would say wayward or rebel in, in a state of rebellion, rejecting God, can I encourage you to continue to pray for them? Continue to pray for them. Don't, don't be silent. Continue to pray for them. We'll pray with you as a church. We'll pray with you as a church. It's, a, it's an understatement, right, uh, that we need the Lord. We need him in every area of our life, raising children, trying to, trying to build a home that would glorify and honor him. Uh, we need him in every, every aspect. But anyways, I pray you have a great, I pray you have a great afternoon. No evening services tonight, anything that was on the schedule, uh, nothing. Uh, no evening services. Uh, so I pray you have a good, uh, a good uh, afternoon. We'll see you back here Wednesday night. We'll show and tell for the Iwana program so parents uh, don't forget, right? <laughs> don't forget to, to, uh, to give your kids something or encourage them to bring something that they can talk to about. Anyways, God bless you. Have a great afternoon. We'll, we'll pray. Essie, would you please pray for our dismissal uh, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. And Lord, just thank you for all the mothers here today, Lord. And Lord, just ask you, Lord, to be with them the rest of the day, Lord, and give them a special day, Lord. And Lord, just ask you, Lord, to bring us back a point in time and just don't pray. Amen. David, David, thank you. <coughs> <coughs>